My name is Christine Laguerre. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm the director of the Evolution, Variation, and Ontogeny of Learning Laboratory. My areas of expertise are cognitive science and cultural psychology. My big picture question is how children become members of the populations that they are born into and how they acquire the incredibly complex constellation of knowledge systems, belief systems, cultural practices, and skill sets of the communities that they're born into. And the title of my presentation is The Development and Diversity of Cumulative Cultural Learning. Well, human culture is unique among animal species in its complexity, diversity, and variability. Children across the globe inhabit complex cultural ecologies that contain knowledge systems, beliefs, practices, cultural artifacts, technologies, and tools of all sorts that are transmitted and modified over generations. In this talk, my intent is to describe the development and diversity of the suite of capacities that explain cultural complexity in humans, namely cumulative cultural learning. I'm using a definition of culture common in the comparative and cognitive scientific literatures, which is group typical behaviors shared by members of a community that rely on socially learned and transmitted information. We know that human minds are highly complex cultural learning systems. And the suite of psychological processes that support cultural learning are universal. But critically, these psychological processes are responsive to highly diverse developmental contexts and cultural ecologies. So culture is cumulative. And what I mean by that is that technological and cultural innovations are progressively incorporated into a population's stock of skills and knowledge uh, in a process that generates ever more sophisticated and complex repertoires of cultural knowledge. Now, culture is highly variable within and between populations, and it's shaped to a very large extent through social learning, which is something that is um, distinctively human. So humans are psychologically prepared to learn from others, from birth. Young children, like those you see here from the communities that I work with in Vanuatu, which is the Mel Melanesian archipelago, are adept at acquiring the beliefs and practices, the knowledge and many languages of whatever human group they are born into, which is truly an extraordinary learning achievement that requires substantial cognitive flexibility. And children use a universal suite of learning capacities to both acquire um, a culture, but also to construct culture. And this suite of learning capacities, they operate synergistically. So all of these different learning processes are occurring um, often um, in tandem and in concert. And we know these learning processes vary in form and frequency within and between populations due to variation in socialization values, um, in child rearing practices, um, and in, in practices and beliefs that are associated with specific educational institutions, skill sets, and knowledge systems. Um, so one thing that I'll talk about briefly in this lecture is the role of formal education in shaping how children learn. Schools transmit more than just knowledge. They transmit ways of learning, ways of interacting, and ways of knowing. So the learning repertoire that children use consists of observation and observational learning, um, exploration, exploratory behavior, participation in ongoing activities, imitation of others, as well as instruction. We know that children are um, highly adept at learning by being instructed um, by others. As I mentioned, these learning processes operate in tandem. Children possess cognitive and communication systems that have evolved to acquire highly complex technical and social skills. One of the extraordinary benefits of the suite of learning processes that children have access to is they give children the flexibility to acquire different kinds of information in different ways. So some of these learning processes are better for learning some types of information or practices or toolkits than others. Now, what you see here 
is a video clip from the uh, the Hadza population, hunter gatherer population in Tanzania. And you see here a young child interacting with um, his grandmother. Uh, the practices they're engaging in here include instruction where the, the grandmother is providing verbal instruction for the child. Uh, there's also imitative learning. So the child is imitating the practices of the grandmother. And the child is engaging in, in observation participation. So is directly involved in the ongoing activity, which in this case is uh, extracting tubers. Now what you see in this video, which is from the Bondongo farmers of the Republic of Congo, these are a small scale agricultural fisher, fisherman village. The, uh, the children in this particular video are engaged in imitative learning. So you'll see that the two more experienced dancers out front are performing a particular dance um, and the younger, novice, uh, less experienced child is imitating the fancy footwork of the two children out front. So there's a process of observation here, certainly a process of imitation and participation in the ongoing uh, dance activity. Okay. One of the things that I've spent a long time researching is not only how children learn, but how members of particular populations, how the adults in particular populations think children learn, uh, which directly impacts how they teach children, how culture is transmitted and communicated. There is enormous cultural variation in people's beliefs about how children learn. So for example, in Vanuatu, uh, which is a population that I mentioned before, if you ask adults how children learn, what a very common response is, well, they learn through doing, they learn through observing and participating in activity. If you ask your American middle-class parents how children learn, they tend to say that children learn by being taught, by being instructed. Which is not to say that children in both populations don't learn through the whole suite of learning capacities that I've discussed, but there's variation in relative frequency and relative emphasis. Uh, one of the ways that you might explain this cultural difference is that formal education systems are much more longstanding and pervasive in industrialized countries like the US than in small scale agricultural populations like Vanuatu. And with the introduction of schools, you get the introduction of particular types of learning processes um, or the prioritization of particular types of learning processes, like in the case of middle-class Euro-American populations an emphasis on formal instruction on the part of both teachers as well as parents. So next I wanna talk a little bit about observation. Now children often learn in the context of social activities and practices um, involving artifacts, technologies, and tools. And children acquire the culturally specific skills and behaviors of their populations by observing the daily activities of others in their environment. Observation is um, a critical way to, to acquire information, but other learning processes like imitation really wouldn't be possible without observational learning. Now, one of the reasons that observational learning is so powerful is that it allows children to acquire knowledge and skills through engagement with people that are more expert than they are, people who have more experience. So observation allows children to learn through a process of apprenticeship um, and to engage in an ongoing activity through watching and through kind of active observation. One of the benefits of observation is that this allows children to potentially avoid uh, making the mistakes of others. So rather than having to learn everything through a potentially costly process of individual, asocial, trial and error learning, learning through observation allows you to benefit from the much more skillful members of, um, more senior members of the population and the family that you're part of. Now we know there's also quite a bit of cultural variation in emphasis on observational learning. So um, one of the, yet again, formal education in, uh, influences this. So children everywhere, of course, can and do learn through observation. There's a much greater emphasis on observational learning in informally educated populations, populations that tend not to participate in formal educational systems and, and teach their children through ongoing activities um, in, the, 
in the world around them. Um, so there's relative variation in how often children are expected to learn through observation. Another way that children learn is through exploration. Uh, any parent is familiar with how curious and how much exploration children engage in. And a fundamental task of childhood is understanding why things happen. So a big part of what motivates exploration is curiosity. And um, at its kind of most basic, exploration is the process by which individuals act on the world in ways that generate information about others or about the environment. And what exploration does is it provides a mechanism for testing children's hypotheses about the causal mechanisms um, in systems that they're curious about. And it also allows them to discover that there is more to an activity or a process or a tool than they currently understand. Um, so it allows children to kind of delve deeper into the underlying causal mechanisms of a system. And we know that children everywhere are especially interested in learning and exploring surprising, unexpected, um, and potentially informative events and outcomes. So they have a preference to explore things that have the potential to teach them something new. Another way that children learn, um, as I've already mentioned, is through participation. And it's not just that children are motivated to participate in the activities of adults around them. Caregivers, educators, siblings, and peers provide children with opportunities to participate in ongoing activities. We're very tolerant of young children participating in activities, which sometimes, in fact, impede the efficiency of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and we, we do this because we recognize that in order for children to learn, they need firsthand direct experience. Uh, and participation is, is not just about learning new skills. Children are motivated to engage with others. They're, they're social learners and they're motivated to affiliate with others. So sharing the activities of others is a way of affiliating and learning to be like those around you. Uh, Participation is really critical because it supports complex skill acquisition. There are a number of skills, complex skills that are really difficult to master exclusively through instruction. Any of you have attempted to learn a complex skill exclusively by reading textbooks and listening to lectures will attest to how this doesn't always translate into practicing the skill directly yourself. You know, it's really critical for children to participate directly. And an apprenticeship model of learning highlights the joint investment of children and their communities, their teachers, their families, in what is in fact a collaborative process of acquiring and transmitting cultural knowledge and skills. Another learning capacity that children engage in quite frequently is imitation. And the capacity to imitate others is integral to the development of human cultural learning. So much of what children need to learn um, is learned through the process of, of imitation, which they are quite intrinsically motivated to engage in. They're motivated to engage in imitation because they want to learn new things, but they also want to be like others in their communities, be like their families and be like their, their peers. So imitation is something that children are highly motivated to engage in. And as you can see from the picture here, this is as much about learning technical uh, skills as it is social affiliation. So children, um, there's multiple functions of imitation. And the transmission of culture more broadly is in fact a product of our propensity for imitation. And imitation allows for the horizontal transmission within generations, as well as vertical transmission between generations. Children everywhere imitate. There is cultural variation in the fidelity with which children imitate. So in some populations that highly value um, high fidelity cultural transmission, imitative fidelity or imitative precision uh, might be a little bit higher. Populations that vary, um, they're the value innovation. The imitative fidelity might be a little bit lower, but in general, children are very precocious and prolific imitators. The final learning process that I wanted to discuss is instruction or teaching. And teaching is arguably the most sophisticated form of social learning, where the teacher and the learner take the perspective of each other. 
teaching has evolved in human populations because it enables efficient information transfer. Uh, it means that children don't have to acquire all this information through independent exploration, which in some cases can be uh, costly, ineffective, inefficient, or, or impossible. Uh, there's many, many different ways that you can engage in teaching. Uh, this involves everything from uh, basically just providing children with an opportunity to uh, kind of follow along uh, all the way to overt direct instruction where children are given play by plays of how a particular activity um, it needs to be implemented. And there's a, a lot of cultural variation in the style of teaching, in the frequency of teaching, in beliefs about you know, the extent to which parents should explicitly teach children a great variety of skills versus allowing children to learn through the other learning processes that I've already discussed. And it appears that formal education has a major impact in, um, particularly in the frequency of teaching within a population. So to wrap up, so children use a repertoire of cultural transmission and acquisition strategies, which optimize the acquisition of group practices, beliefs, and values. Teaching practices in particular reflect the values and educational institutions of particular social contexts and ecologies. Efficient cultural learning requires using imitation and uh, exploration or innovation quite flexibly. And cross-cultural research in particular has the potential to address some of the critical gaps in our scientific understanding of the role played by cultural learning in ontogenetic outcomes. And studying cultural diversity in particular provides critical insight into the development and evolution of cognition and culture. Mm -hmm.